Okay, welcome everybody. I'm glad you could join us here for Des Moines University's Mini Medical School. My name is Hannah DeGeest, if you don't already know me, and I host this series for you. Um, I'm very happy to be back in person this year. We had took a two-year hiatus of meeting in person due to the pandemic, so I'm very happy to be here and have all of you joining us. Um, and also welcome to everybody that's joining us online too. We are streaming this online. Um, and recording it so that it'll be available afterwards if you'd like to rewatch the session or maybe share it with friends or family. Um, it'll be up on our website starting about Friday. Um, we'll put it live on, on Friday, um, along with the slides, the PowerPoint slides that Dr. Hive will be sharing with you today. So if you wanna look at those, we used to print those off. We're trying to conserve a little bit of paper this year, um, but those will be available online. Um, at dmu.edu slash minimed, the same website that you went to register to come here and all of that, um, it'll be available there, the slides as well as the recording afterwards. So, okay, well, I'm not gonna take up too much of your time today. Um, if some of you remember in the past, I like to do little quizzes um, every week to help us remember what we learned the previous week. But of course, since this is week one, we're just getting started. We didn't have anything last week, so I have nothing to quiz you on. Um, but next week, be ready. I'll have just a couple questions for us so we can review. Um, but I do like to share a little bit about Des Moines University, just so everyone's aware. We have 10 academic programs here at DMU. Um, you might remember from, which you're probably like, Hannah, I wouldn't remember this fact, but we used to only have eight programs the last time we were meeting for mini medical school two years ago in person. Um, but we've added two programs. We've added a um, PhD program as well as our OTD program, which is a um, doctorate in OT. So um, occupational therapy, to be clear on that. Um, so I just wanted to list those out for you so you were aware um, and knew all the different programs that we offer here. Um, we're happy to offer all of these programs as well as IPE events, which are interprofessional education events, so we can get all of our students working together and learning more about what each one of their disciplines does. Um, we think that's a great advantage um, that DMU has. So, all right, well, I will get started. Do we have any questions about mini med school or tonight? You can always ask me beforehand or later, but just wanna make sure I open it up too. All right, there is popcorn in the back. I see some of you guys already saw that. So if you need a snack, go ahead and feel free to at any time pop up and get some of that. Um, Dr. Hively will be asking for questions at the end of the session. Um, so we'll be sure to get your questions answered. Um, but if you do have any questions um, and you're watching online or virtually later or you know right now, you can always email those to me or to questions at dmu.edu. So that's another option for you. Um, restrooms are out this door and to the left. You'll see they're marked right there. So feel free to get up at any point if you need to use the restroom. Um, right outside of the doors as well, there's a water refill station. So if you brought your water bottle, which I see some of you did, um, feel free to fill it up there. There's also a drinking fountain too. So if you're feeling like you need some water, um, we have that out there for you. Um, all right, well, I will just go ahead and bring up Dr. Hively's presentation for us. Get this on out of the way. Okay. Ready? Dr. Matt Hively completed his undergraduate degrees in psychology and sociology from Iowa State University, his master's degree in counseling from Western Illinois University, and his PhD in human development and family studies with a specialization in marriage and family therapy from Iowa State University. Dr. Hively has over 20 years of experience working as a licensed medical health, mental health counselor. He has provided individual and family therapy in various settings, including community mental health centers and group and private practice. Dr. Hively is currently a staff counselor in the Student Counseling Center here at DMU and has held this position now for over three years. Dr. Hively enjoys working with the students here at DMU and specializes in helping students who struggle with depression, anxiety, and stress management. We're very lucky to have him here working with our students too, and I know they enjoy working with him as well. 
All right. Well, welcome, Dr. Hively. Thank you, Hannah. Can everybody hear me okay? Yeah. Awesome. It's great to be here. I'm so grateful to see all of you here as well. Um, <clears throat> excuse my voice. Hopefully, it'll be okay as I'm talking here tonight. Um, we're here to talk about stress, and that's the topic. And this is not the easiest topic to talk about. You know, it's certainly something that everyone experiences. And as I was trying to prepare what kind of information to provide to all of you, it was you know, a little bit of a challenge. Um, you know, this is something that all of us are familiar with. We all experience stress in our own ways, right? And everybody kind of has their own unique perspective in terms of what causes you stress, what's difficult for you, what sort of things do you struggle with each and every day. And so it's a familiar topic. It's something that many of us can, on a regular basis, be able to say, yes, there are things that cause me stress. And many of you might identify different things that might cause you stress. You might have different definitions for, you know, what does stress mean to you? How does it look? What does it feel like? And so trying to come up with information that can be helpful to anyone who might be experiencing some of these challenges is not always easy. Now, obviously, any of you can go online. You can do a search on stress, and you can look up a lot of information that you might hear tonight. Um, I think the last time I checked, if you do a Google search on stress or stress management, you get billions of hits coming back, right? So there's just an, an enormous amount of information out there that can be pretty overwhelming. So trying to come up with a way that we can help all of you and, and myself included in a, in a short amount of time, which is what we're going to do tonight, hopefully this is information that will be helpful. Some of it might be information that you've heard before. It might be some of the same things that you've heard over and over again. And the reason for that is because not much has changed when it comes to what do we know about stress and how to manage it more effectively. So we know what works. We know what tends to not work. And so it's important to recognize that using those things that we know work and trying to use them on a regular basis is what's so important. And sometimes we forget the basics, right? We forget some of the things that we know are helpful and they're good for us, they help, but uh, we tend to just sort of forget about that. So maybe for tonight, it's a little bit of a reminder in terms of going back to the basics, understanding as best as we can what's going on and how to manage it a little bit more effectively, okay? If you have any questions along the way, you can certainly raise your hand and ask, but there will be time at the end to answer those. So maybe jot down some thoughts if you're thinking about something along the way. Um, the information tonight hopefully will be accessible in terms of understanding it. Um, we'll present a little bit of the kind of the neuroscience that's going on here, but we're not going to get too far into that. So, you know, just kind of have a basic understanding of what's happening and, and do our best. So, you know, when we look at what we're really trying to accomplish here, and, you know, this, this does seem very simple and basic, right? It's like trying to understand exactly what stress is. And, you know, being able to identify techniques that we know at least based on the research, and I've found in my own personal life, uh, as someone who struggled with anxiety quite a bit, um, but also in the many years that I've been practicing and helping clients, helping them identify what works for them when it comes to managing the stress in their lives at various stages of life, okay? When we talk about how the brain reacts to stress, what exactly goes on, and we talk about how each of us are impacted by it, it can be helpful to make sense of it in terms of what the research shows and what we know about this kind of stuff. What's really helpful though is to try to personalize it to yourself as best as you can, okay? What I mean by that is as we go through some of this stuff, take the time to try to make sense of how this might apply to you. Because every single one of us might react differently to various situations. We're gonna make sense of that a little bit. Some situations might impact some of us one way and it might impact others another way. And so it's trying to understand for yourself, okay, what's your understanding of stress and how it affects you? What has been some of your experiences? How have they impacted you and how you feel? 
So try to personalize it as best as you can. And the more that you can have a better understanding of how the daily stressors affect you personally and how you respond to them, that's what can help you then figure out a better way to manage some of this, okay? So we're going to do our best to try to work through both of these and spend a little bit of time with that tonight, and uh, we'll just kind of see how it goes, okay? So you know, where do we start with some of this? And this is part of the challenge is, is kind of finding a starting point when it comes to just basic stress management. Um, I'm probably jumping ahead of myself, but I, I remember a quote you know, many years that I heard, many years ago that I had read somewhere, actually. Um, and the, the person was basically saying that the best way to get out of your own head is to um, deal with your other senses as they come up, okay? To engage your other senses. And so the idea here is to recognize that we all experience the world in a very different way. Okay? We go through life, our senses bring information from the outside world. Okay? And if you think about for yourself, and you probably don't spend a lot of time, I know I don't, I always think about it, but you know, there's things that we see, we smell, we taste, we touch. So we just exist each and every day by bringing in information. That's how we all exist each and every day. So what's happening there, okay? You know, right now you're, you're listening and I'm talking and you know, if you're eating, if you're you know, in a relationship and communicating, if you're going on a vacation, each and every day you are having some sort of an experience where you are bringing information in from the outside world and you're doing your best to try to make sense of that, okay? And each of us does it differently. So when it comes to trying to understand how you interact with the world and how things affect you, it's important to take the time to recognize how do I manage information as it comes in? How, I, how do I take the time to recognize what it's doing for me and, and how it makes sense, okay? And so we have this system in place where this is how we exist. Now, what do we do when we bring information in from the outside world, right? We, we go through our days and we do various things. So stress is this thing that's kind of hard to define. It just exists outside of us. And again, we all can experience it in different ways. But there's this idea going on here where you think about how you live, how you exist, okay? Um, there's been studies that have been done where they have found that eyewitness testimony has been found to be um, not very reliable, okay? And the reason for that, there's a professor at Iowa State who spent you know, decades studying this. One of the studies they'll, they'll do is similar to a situation like this, and you may have seen some of this, where in the middle of doing a presentation, somebody might run in in the middle of it and steal something off of here and run out, okay? And then afterward, they'll go around and they would ask all of you to describe the person who did that. Now, how many of you would probably describe the same thing? So what they have found is, and it's so interesting, is that so many different descriptions are given in terms of who this person is and what they look like and what they were wearing. Now, all of you are sitting here and you're watching the same thing. So if a person came in here and did that and left, why wouldn't all of you give the exact same description? Back when I used to do um, a lot of years in private practice and I did a lot of couples counseling, there was a thing that came up. And many of you have maybe experienced this. I know I have as well, being in a relationship where there was some sort of a disagreement and the, the couple who were in talking in therapy might say, you know, they're recalling uh, an argument they had a week ago. And the one person might say, you know, you said this, right? And the other person will say, I didn't say that. I would never say something like that. I don't know what you're talking about. And the first person would say, well, no, I, that's exactly what you said. And it was really rude. And I wish you hadn't said that. And the other person would have said, I, I, no, I would never say anything like that. What's happening there? Okay. Is it a memory issue or do we have people experiencing things in very different ways? And so this perspective thing is so powerful, not only when it comes to just experiencing the world and living your lives, it's also very powerful when it comes to interpreting things, especially when it comes to any sort of threats or when it comes to stress. So what happens here? You know, we each have our own unique perspective. Even though all of you are sitting here in the same room, you all have your own unique perspective. Okay? From that perspective, you're bringing information in from the outside world. That contributes to your personal perception. And you have your own unique brain that's interpreting what's going on and trying to make sense of it. Okay? 
your perception then is really your understanding of what's going on and how you make sense of it. And that perception then contributes to your reality. If you've ever been in a situation where someone shared feeling a particular way and they said they were scared, you know, such and such scared me, and your reaction to that was, how could you be scared? Are you kidding? That's ridiculous. And this comes up a lot in relationships where someone might feel something and they want to be validated, but instead your reaction is, are you kidding me? Really? That bothered you? That upset you? So sometimes it's difficult to make sense of that in terms of how one person could see something or be in an experience and feel a particular way, have a reaction, and someone else can have a completely different reaction. So this is what we do. We exist each and every day. We bring information in. We have our own unique perspective. That information comes in. It contributes to our perception. And of course, that's our reality of what's going on. So what do we do with that? Okay, just kind of put a note in that and just sort of let that sit in terms of what that all might mean for you. I like kind of the bridge analogy when we come to just, you know, transition into stress and trying to make sense of it. You know, sort of the, the engineering problem of what is the purpose of a bridge? It's supposed to support a certain amount of weight, right? A certain load. That's the whole point of it. And there's design components and engineering components that a lot of work goes into that to, to make it work the way that it's supposed to work. And of course, what happens if it's overloaded, if it's, you know, can't take on any more than what's already been on it, then it's, it's not gonna work. Um, we're not gonna get into it tonight, but burnout is usually something that we see when we're, we're overloaded, okay? We usually see this in the workplace, but this can happen at home as well. Um, burnout is, uh, I've just reached a point where I can't take any more, it's become too much. In the helping professions, we talk about that as, um, you know, struggling, it's, it's um, the ability to start to not care it's compassion fatigue is really what they call it. You know, I, I just, I struggle with not caring any longer because it's just become too much. So certainly that's one of those signs of stress as we hit that point where it's just become too much. Maybe we can't put our finger on why we feel the way we feel, but it's just become too much. And we're having some sort of reaction to it. Now, what is that reaction? Well, we're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of what that means. When demands are placed on you, do you know how you react? Do you know how you feel? Do you know what it means when too many demands have been placed on you? A lot of times we wait too long and we don't notice these things along the way. And so we, we feel something, we don't know what it is. A lot of times we're just irritable. Maybe we shut down. Um, we're snapping at people that we don't really want to snap at. We're, we're having strong reactions in situations that probably doesn't call for that kind of a reaction, but that's what we do. Do you know that for yourself? When things become too much, have you ever taken the time to really pause and say, this is how I know when I'm feeling stress. I have my own definition of what stress is. This is what it means to me. And when I'm feeling stressed and it's becoming too much, this is how I know it. And the more that you can identify and personalize that for yourself, the better you can then manage it, which is what's really important here, right? It's, it's taking the time to really understand what's happening, why I'm reacting the way I am, why do I feel the way I feel. Now, what happens here when, you know, we have too much being placed on us? We're, we're experiencing these demands, we're experiencing stress, and again, we're using that stress to define many different things, but for each of you, it's taking the time to really define what does stress mean to you? How do you define it? How does it show up in your life? What we tend to see happen, this homeostasis, and this shows up a lot when it comes to just how our bodies work, how our brains work, um, we're affected in a particular way by certain things, and we have systems in place that then react to whatever's going on, and then we do our best to try to bring things back to some sort of equilibrium, right? And there's a lot of different examples of that. Um, you know, you sweat if you get too hot, right? The sweating is the body's way of trying to cool itself off, and that happens automatically. In fact, if you're overheated and not sweating, that's a problem, right? Um, maybe if you get too cold, you're shivering, and that shivering is maybe the body's way of saying, look, we need to try to warm ourselves up. 
Frostbite is typically in the finger and toes. Why? Because the body wants to protect the core and everything slows down to protect this. And so the outer extremities are at greater risk. So the body reacts to things as they happen and sometimes it happens automatically. There's a system in place that keeps you alive and those things, you know, we're glad that they happen automatically. So the body's trying to maintain this balance. And this information, you know, you might be familiar with if you've studied some of these things. The nervous system, if you know what that is, basically the way the brain and the body communicate with each other, and that's what the nervous system does. It's the most basic way of explaining that. And we've got a lot of other systems in place that help us exist, help us stay alive, help us to function. The nervous system is the one where, you know, this idea that you bring in information, whether you're learning or listening or talking, whatever's going on, and making sure that you make sense of that information and then using it for yourself in some way. The brain makes sense of that, and then the body is reacts in some way. So that connection is there based on this system that's in place. If we break it down a little bit, and again, if you're familiar with some of this and, and how it works, you know, we've got the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system. And so again, you think about this, this balance, this equilibrium. How do we keep things balanced at all times? So there's this automatic process in place and it's still part of our DNA. It's probably the thing that all of you are familiar with and it's that threat response that's there to help keep us alive. It's still part of who we are, even though that for many of us, the world that we live in is very different than our ancestors. It might be very different than other people who live around the world where maybe there are real threats. And real threats, we'll talk about what that means. But when you think about this system and, and what it's supposed to do, the idea is, okay, <clears throat> something's happening. And I'm not sure what it is, but I'm having some reaction to it, and it's making me uncomfortable, and you can attach words to it. I'm, I'm scared, I'm uncomfortable, I'm, I don't feel safe, or I'm nervous. You know, some of those, those feelings that showed up. Um, you know, I, I don't know what it is, but it, it, it doesn't feel good. And it, it's such an important thing to try to make sense of that for yourself, and pay attention to it and not ignore it. So something's happening, and, and what's happening is, in some way you're feeling threatened. Now, what does that mean? Again, it's trying to personalize it for yourself. What, what is a threat, and, and why am I reacting to it? So part of this process of reacting to any sort of stress, however you define it for yourself, is that the body reacts, and ultimately the goal is to keep you safe. At the end of the day, that's what we're all trying to do, right? Stay, stay alive, stay safe. So... The sympathetic nervous system, if you really want to get into the terminology behind it, it's doing its job by doing something to help keep you safe. Once it detects that there's no longer a threat, then the other part of the nervous system kicks in and calms you back down to bring you back to a balance. In most cases, this all happens automatically. It's not something that you have to think about, which is typically good, right? If it's a, a real life or death scenario, it's not something where you want to stand and think about it. I wonder what's going to happen in this situation. No, it's just you respond. And a lot of times people will be in life and death scenarios and you ask them after the words, you know, what were you thinking when you ran into that house that was on fire? And what do they typically say? I, I wasn't. <laughs> and that's exactly right. They weren't thinking because that part of your brain just, it's not working at that moment. If you want to get a little bit further into you know, some of the neuroscience behind that, I've got some of that terminology here, but when we talk about the nervous system, and again, some of this language you might be familiar with, and if not, that's okay. But it's just trying to get a sense of what's going on here and what part of the brain is uh, responding. I think this is important because you know, we see this with other types of mental health issues, whether it's depression or anxiety. Um, and stress isn't that much different. It's really trying to recognize that if I'm feeling stressed, that's a real thing, okay? And your brain has a real reaction to it. It's not something where oh, I'm just making this up and I'm scared and I shouldn't be scared and it's a bunch of nonsense. You know, that's what people used to say many years ago. And so we recognize that when you're having a reaction to something, there's a reason for it. And the most important thing you can do is to try to pay attention to what that reaction is and, and help it make sense for you, okay? 
There's a system in the brain, the limbic system. It's such an important part of the brain when it comes to managing stress and understanding all of this. Um, the, the limbic system is sometimes talked about as far as the emotional part of the brain. Um, from an evolutionary standpoint, I think they sometimes talk about it as it's the, considered the oldest part of the brain. And we'll compare that to the prefrontal cortex you see right in the front there. Um, and there's a difference. You know, sometimes people in therapy might talk about how you know, something makes sense to them. They know something logically, but maybe they're struggling to make sense of it emotionally. And there's other examples where you know, we have this difference between you know, what I'm thinking and what I'm feeling. And it's important to recognize that there's a reason for that because typically it's two different areas of the brain that are being engaged. The amygdala, anyone heard that word before? Yeah. So that's a good one to remember. If there's anything that you want to take from this, recognize that the amygdala absolutely is part of this threat response. And it's automatic. It's, it's the autonomic nervous system is part of what's happening here. It's not something you have to think about. When something is happening in the world around you and you're having some sort of reaction to it, which is your perspective, right? That's the thing you gotta remember. People might ignore it and say, you know what? This is silly that I, I'm scared. I should be able to walk to my car at night and not be afraid. Well, maybe, or maybe if there is a fear there, as long as it's not too debilitating, it's something where, okay, you know, you see someone approaching and you're having a reaction. Is it silly for me to react that way? Do I recognize that, okay, if I'm having a reaction, it must be a reason for that. And let's validate that. Let's be okay with that. Let's pay attention to it. Let's not ignore it. The amygdala is there to help us stay safe, and it reacts automatically. Now, if you want to get into some of the more neuroscience type stuff, I'm not going to get too much into this today, but I know um, some of the students here, they're taught the HPA access. That's information that you can look up. If you really are interested in understanding and making sense of what's really happening when the brain is being stressed when demands are being placed on it and it's having a reaction and something's going on and it's trying to make sense of it. So we have the amygdala, we have the limbic system, this anterior cingulate cortex, you can look that up if you're interested. Um, it in, is involved with sort of trying to connect that emotional part of the brain with the thinking part of the brain, the cognitive part. This HPA access is involved with this homeostasis that we talked about, the, the brain and body trying to keep things completely stable at all times, as best as it can. The insula is something that you can look up. It's, it's been talked about more recently in terms of its involvement with how this works, and it's you know, just your, your understanding of how you are reacting to certain situations. What sort of response are you having? So we have all this going on here, and it's, these are real things that have been identified in the brain as real reactions to situations that we encounter. So I think that's where it's helpful is if you ever kind of stop and think, you know what, I don't know why I'm feeling this way, but it's, it's ridiculous, it's silly. No, there's a real thing happening within you. And your experiences in the past can contribute to this. Um, you know, her, your heredity, there's, there's different factors involved. And for whatever reason, if that's how you're feeling, let's be okay with that. This, again, is what you're probably very familiar with. <clears throat> Some of the language here, this fight or flight, freeze response. Flop or friend, those are a couple of others you may not have heard of, but you know what, what are we talking about here? Well, again, when we pick up on something that's happening that for whatever reason feels threatening to us, typically we have this automatic reaction. One of the things that <clears throat> I think is important to point out here, a lot of times you'll see, and I'm just, this is kind of a tangent, but I think this is helpful. These things are listed in this order, this fight, flight, or freeze. You've ever seen it listed that way? It's almost always listed in that order. Well, part of the problem with that is, is it, it suggests that there might be a hierarchy there. If you're working with someone or if, if you yourself have experienced some sort of trauma in the past, one of the things that might come up is the person might say, you know, you know, as a child, I, I had this thing happen, and I've always blamed myself because I should have fought back, and I didn't. I didn't fight back. And so the, the, the suggestion there, the judgment there is that, 
you know, this fight, flight, or freeze response means that, you know, it's, it's a hierarchy. And so you should fight first. That should always be your reaction. Um, and then maybe run away or then you freeze up. But in reality, what we understand is this isn't a hierarchy. If anything's happened in your life and you reacted a particular way, maybe you did fight back or maybe you ran away, maybe you froze up. The number one thing to remember is to not judge that reaction because chances are that wasn't within your control. However you reacted or responded, that's probably exactly what was needed for you to survive in that situation. So we have to practice a lot of grace and forgiveness in the past when it comes to how things happened and how we may have reacted and not judging a reaction that we had that truly was automatic and not within your control. The amygdala, when we, again, you go back to your perception, your perspective, you know, what is your reality? How do you experience the world? And you pick up on something that is too much of a demand on you. It's too much stress. It's affecting you. And you realize it. You sense it. If it's really threatening in the moment, this is typically what we find. The adrenaline that's released into your body, the epinephrine, it's, it's there for a reason, right? Now, a panic attack... If anyone has had a panic attack, how does that feel? <laughs> That's a fun thing, right? What's happening there? Well, typically with a panic attack, I am feeling threatened in a way where I truly feel like my life is in danger. Now, part of the problem with a panic attack is in most cases it's a false alarm. We're being triggered by something. We, maybe we smell something or we see something. Um, it, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things that can trigger some past event, if that's what it is. Oftentimes it is from trauma. But that panic attack is your brain's perception that you are in danger, and it releases adrenaline. And so the adrenaline, which is causing your heart to race and your body temperature to go up, um, it, it can make your stomach hurt. There's all sorts of things that can happen. It's, it's a big false alarm, right? It feels like you're going to die, but you're not. So it's not a fun thing to experience. In a true life or death scenario, that adrenaline that's pumping through you is the very thing that's going to help keep you alive. It can help you run faster. It can make you stronger. You can be quicker. So more blood is pumped to the muscles to make you defend yourself. All of this is there for a reason. Here's the question, though, when it comes to stress. And, and this is part of the challenge. If there's one thing you want to take from this, and there's a number of things that I think can be helpful. I know this has helped me personally over the years when I talked with um, clients and just learning about what happens. So when you think about the amygdala, you think about your perception. What is a real threat? How do you know if you really are in danger? And the reality here is when you talk about the amygdala and its role in all of this and what's happening with the brain, it does not know the difference between what, whatever is considered a real threat, however you define that, or your perception of a threat. So what's a real threat? I, you know, I suppose we look at it extreme. You know, if, if you're out in the street and someone comes up to you and pulls out a loaded gun and points it at you, most might be able to look at that situation and say, okay, that's a, that's a real threat. That's a real life or death scenario, I, I think, unless you're just used to that all the time. Yeah, people point guns at me all the time. No, that's, that's a real threat, okay? Compare that to, I'm worried that my boss might be angry at me. Guess what? The exact same part of the brain is being triggered. Believe it or not, both of those things are threats. And so, you know, if I'm on edge and I'm nervous because I'm afraid that my best friend is mad at me and they're not talking to me and I sent them a message and they haven't replied back, that's a threat, right? It still feels the same way. So is it a real threat? Is it your perception of a threat? Another way of putting it, someone might say, is am I in danger or am I just experiencing a lot of discomfort, right? And, and so there can be a tremendous amount of discomfort based on this idea that I think that something is threatening me in some way. 
it's important to make sense of this, especially when it comes to you know, reactions. And, and if you are someone who maybe has a history of anxiety or you have experienced panic attacks before, the number one thing for a panic attack, by the way, is to really do nothing at all. It's just to sit because adrenaline pumps through you. It lasts about 10 minutes and you got to let it complete that cycle. That's not really the time to try to process why you're experiencing a panic attack. You know, the goal right there is to just remind yourself or else unless somebody else can help you. I'm safe right now. Nothing bad is happening. I'm just going to sit here. And even though this feels like I'm going to die, I'm really not going to die. And so you just remind yourself of that. And it, it will get better because we see it all the time. I've had people in my office have full-blown panic attacks. And within a few minutes, it goes away without doing anything. So is it a real threat or is it your perception, as we talked earlier, you know, your perception of what's going on, your understanding of all these things, your past experiences? So can you tell the difference when you think about it for yourself, when you look at your experiences, when you look at things that you've struggled with, things that trigger you? And you get to define that, okay? Your understanding of what is a real threat and how does that affect you? Or when is it my perception? Probably one of the number one things, I know I've struggled with this a lot, and I talk to students all the time who struggle with this, as you might imagine. And many of you might think this. The, the comment is made is that, you know, I worry about what other people think of me. Anyone ever bought, worried about that? I worry about what other people think of me. We got to add some words there to help that make more sense. Because it's not that you're worried about what other people think of you. What's going on is it's your perception of what you think other people may or may not be thinking about you at any given time, right? There's a, there's a difference there. It's not what do other people think of me, it's, it's your perception. And you're drawing some conclusion, you're making assumptions that you know, is there any evidence to support that? That's part of the problem, right, is that I'm having this strong reaction and I'm, I'm feeling overloaded and I'm feeling stressed. And how often am I feeling that there's some threat, you know, something as is, is bad is going to happen? And we do this with kids a lot, actually. You know, with kids, it's like, where's the evidence? So, so-and-so's mad at me. Okay, that sounds awful. What makes you think they're mad at you? Well, I just know that they are. <laughs> Well, okay, well, if that were true, that, that doesn't sound fun. But again, where's the evidence? What tells you that that's what's going on? How do you know that? The issue we run into, and this is less about, you know, maybe those real threats where I truly feel like my life is in danger, and this is more about just the daily demands that are placed on us, whether it's professionally or personally, you know, what do those demands look like for you when, you know, people are expecting you to do things or you have responsibilities or, you know, just all those things that we all have to do on a daily basis that oftentimes we don't want to do, but it builds up, right? We talk about this idea here, which is caring, and talk about how there's consequences to caring. I don't know if you've ever thought about that. Um, and consequences doesn't necessarily imply a, a, a bad thing, right? You know, it's, it's just it's the result of caring. Why are there consequences to caring? You know, some might say, well, what, what is the purpose of life? What, what gives us, you know, a, a reason to live? And for a lot of people, it's, well, it's, it's finding something that's important to you, something that you value. And you, you need to, to identify that for yourself in terms of what you want that to look like. But what do you care about? So here's the problem, right? Let's think about this. The moment that you decide to care about anything, <laughs> the exact moment that happens, you've just created a threat in your life. That's the dilemma we face. Think about anything you care about, whether it's family, your partner, your job, your health. The moment you make that decision to care about whatever that thing is, you've just created a threat in the brain because now you're motivated toward making sure that whatever that thing is that you care about, I want to make sure nothing bad happens to it. That's the consequence of caring, right? And some people don't want to live that way, and they 
maybe decide to hide from the world and they don't want to have any experiences, they want to stay safe, they don't want to ever take any risks, they don't want to be vulnerable. That's one way to live, that's not for me to judge that. But for others, I think we recognize that, okay, I think I do want to live, I do want to take risks, I do want to be vulnerable, I do want to put myself out there, I have experiences. But the moment I do that, I now have created all these quote unquote threats that are gonna create stress in my life. That's what happens. So what do we do about that? Just stop caring or recognize that no, I do want to care and as a result of caring, that also means that with that comes a lot of stress. When it comes to the stress that you feel, when it comes to the things that you care about, we have to take a look at that as well. Because one of the things you care about could be, I care very much about what other people think of me. We go back to that example. What are the consequences of that? (laughs) For many of us, if you think about what causes the most stress in your life, and there could be a lot of different examples of that, more often than not, if you were to take the time to think about what's causing me the most stress, How often do you think it's you being stressed about something in your life that you are trying to control that you have absolutely no control over? It's probably one of those common things we struggle with. You can look at the the picture there, you know, what are the things that are really out of my control, what's within my control? Um, For someone like myself and many others, I've struggled with, you know, pretty significant anxiety throughout my life, and it's something that I I battle a lot. You know, I had a lot of fear even just doing this presentation. I've done many of these, and yet I feel the same way, right? It's this idea of, well, are people going to be interested? Are they going to judge me? Um, Are they going to be able to tell how nervous I truly am on the inside right now without showing it on the outside, right? So, you know, we think about all these kinds of things, and it can feel scary. With anxiety, one of the things that And if you experience anxiety, you might struggle with this as well. One of the hardest things to to accept, that that pill to swallow, right, is this idea that there's very little in your life that you truly have control over. And for a lot of people, that's, that's, you know, think about it. If there's anything you can think of, it's like, well, I know I'm pretty sure I have control over that. If you really break it down, chances are you'll find that, no, at any given moment, that could just go away. You might be able to have some influence over certain things, and we talk about it that way. You know, I try to influence certain things. I try to make a difference. That's okay. But in reality, at the end of the day, there's really no control. So how much of your stress, those demands that you're experiencing, are coming from places that are outside of you? You have no control over it, but you truly believe that you do. And so each and every day, that's where your time and energy is going, toward controlling things that are out of your control. And it's exhausting. So what do we do about this? If you look at, you know, we're going to use some terminology here. The prefrontal cortex, that's the front part of the brain. That's the cognitive part of the brain, if you want some of those terms. The thinking part of the brain, right? Right? Um, executive functioning is, is, if you're familiar with that sort of language, you know, it's the amygdala. We talked about what that is, and that's more of the emotional part of the brain. And so part of this is, you know, where is this stress coming from? And what kind of stress is it? What, what does it feel like to me? How am I reacting to it? If you can get a sense of what might be going on and how it's affecting you, then it, it greatly contributes to your ability then to decide, okay, well, what do I do about it? Because I think a lot of times that's our struggle. It's like, okay, well, yeah, I guess there's a lot of things in my life I can't control. They're stressing me out. There's nothing I can do about it, evidently. I feel threatened, and I have these automatic reactions to these threats that I guess I can't control those either. So I guess I'm just living life, being stressed all the time, and freaking out, and being uncomfortable, and I guess that's just how life is, right? So, not exactly. There are some things that we can do. So, let's talk about that. Cortex-based stress. And we don't necessarily have the time to go into it tonight, but 
you know, there's, there's a lot here that we could look at. If you're familiar, if you've ever been in therapy or familiar with different types of therapy, one of the most common ones is CBT, it's cognitive behavioral therapy. And truly at the heart of that is this idea of trying to identify thinking errors, if you're familiar with those. Um, so what are thinking errors? There, there are ways that we think that are probably irrational, they're not, they're not very logical. Um, one of the more common ones might be like this all or nothing reaction that you might have to things. Um, with students, it's like, you know, I, I missed one question on the exam, so that means I failed the whole thing, and you truly feel like a failure because I didn't get a perfect score. It's this all or nothing way of living. There's no in between. So with cortex-based stress, it's this idea that how much of the stress that I'm feeling has a lot to do with the way that I'm thinking. Okay? So if you're doing any sort of CBT therapy, oftentimes a lot of that involves taking the time to jot down some of your thoughts that you have at times. You know, I'm feeling stressed and, and there's a thought that's associated or the thought that comes up, what, what is that thought? What, how, what was I thinking about during that time when I was feeling so stressed? Um, so the goal of that if we decide that a lot of the stress that I'm feeling has to do with the way that I think, is recognize that, okay, there are ways that you can practice changing the way you think. And that sounds very easy to do. And for anyone who's tried that, you're shaking your head like, no, that's really, really hard. <laughs> that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. I was like, well, this is just how I think. Well, you need to not think that way. I'm like, yeah, right. So, but it's something that you can practice. Amygdala-based stress or... or you know, emotional stress, you know, or nervous system stress. So really what we're talking about there is recognizing that, okay, I must be perceiving that there's some sort of threat, whatever that might be. I'm having this automatic reaction. So what that means is my goal is to calm down my nervous system. And there's a lot of different information out there in terms of how to do that, and we'll go over some of the things. But at the end of the day, it's recognizing that, okay, is this truly a threat or is this a false alarm? And when it's a false alarm, that means my nervous system is trying to convince me of something that probably isn't true or necessary. And that's a lot of trying to manage this stuff. We, we say this with a lot of mental health concerns. We say this with depression. We say this with anxiety, which is what they do is they try to convince you of things that aren't true, if you think about it. And I want to be careful with some triggering words here in case, you know, some of you might be struggling with this, but, you know, what does depression tell you? Depression tells you that you're no good, nothing you do matters, um, it's hopeless, nothing will ever change, and in fact, you might be doing people a favor if you are no longer around. That's what depression tells you, and guess what? That's all a lie. That's not true. And the problem with depression is, how do I not believe those lies that I'm hearing every single day? What does anxiety tell you? It tries to tell you that you're in danger all the time. There's always a threat. There's always something bad that's going to happen. And your job is to, full-time job, to make sure that you prevent all the bad things from happening. And it's a lie. It's not true. But that's what mental illness does. So if the nervous system is having a reaction based on your perception, your perspective, wherever you're at, whatever you're seeing or feeling, then it's going to react. And if you can identify that and recognize, okay, when I'm feeling threatened, but I'm not really threatened, I know that this is how I typically react. And what is it for you? Is it deep breathing? Do you feel hot? Do you feel dizzy? Does your stomach hurt? Do your muscles tense up? Have you ever taken the time to really understand that for yourself and know that, okay, this is how I know when I'm feeling stressed? Because one of the best things you can do is to be able to just say, I'm really stressed right now. And I know that sounds kind of silly, but that makes a huge difference. Have you ever done that before? I'm really angry right now. It's amazing how that can just pause things for a moment and validate the fact that, okay, this is what I'm feeling. We recognize, and this is a powerful thing to, to, to look at, there is this very strong connection between thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. And so 
If you're interested in changing one of these things, I want to change the way I think. I want to change the way I feel. I want to change the way I behave. Pick one of those, and chances are, if you look at the other two, they affect it. Typically, the one that we probably can have the most influence over is the way that we think. And again, it's taking the time to really learn how to do that. Have I ever challenged some of those thoughts that I have? One of the things that we might ask you to do if you're in therapy is pay attention to how you treat yourself, right? You know, what sort of things do you tell yourself? Do you judge yourself a lot? Do you put yourself down? And a lot of times people don't have any idea how often they do that to themselves until they take the time to really pay attention to that. I'm such an idiot, I can't believe I would do something like that. I mean, we say those kinds of things all the time, but every single time you say that, it's just, it's just a jab, right? Do that enough throughout the day and you're conditioning your brain to, to just be a certain way. So we have to pay attention to that. Are you stupid? No. No, you're not. So why are you saying that? Would you ever say that to a friend? Of course not, right? The way we talk to ourselves, we wouldn't talk to a complete stranger, and yet that's what we do. But it's pretty amazing how taking the time to look at my thoughts, determine if they are rational, what's going on there, and see how they can actually influence how I feel. It's like, oh, well, I don't feel good when I think that way, but when I think this way, I think I, I feel different. And because I'm feeling slightly different, I've noticed that that actually impacts how I behave and how I act. You ever seen any of these before? Should is probably the one that we look at the most. Um, if you want a way to remember it, and I'm not going to curse here, but it's, they say don't should all over yourself. You know, if you've ever heard that before. So if you think about it, in most cases, and maybe, you know, the rest of tonight or the rest of you know, the day tomorrow, just sort of pay attention to that. Listen to other people when they use a statement that has the word should in it. And think about it for yourself. Anytime you've made a statement that has the word should in it, typically there's judgment there. Okay, We're judging ourselves. I should have done such and such. What it suggests is there's some standard that you didn't meet. And you're judging yourself for it. Now, the thing we got to look at is, well, where does that standard come from? Because any time you suggest that I should have done this or that or I should not have done that, okay, maybe that's true, but have you ever stopped for a moment and pause and say, okay, well, what is that based on exactly, though? Well, I just, I, I should have done more today. I didn't do enough. Maybe, but, okay, based on what? Well, it just, it just wasn't enough. I'm not, okay, well, again, what are you basing that on? Where does it say that you should have done more than what you did? Same with always and never. You know, those statements typically are not true. It's, it's not very often you can make a statement that has the word always in it or never in it um, that, that is completely true. So we want to challenge some of those things. Um, anger. This is part of the whole stress response because more often than not when people talk about how stressed they feel. Has anyone felt angry when they're stressed? I mean, that's just a very common thing. Now, very quickly, one of the problems with anger, and this is just a very quick introduction to kind of the whole anger management thing. People talk a lot about anger management. They even made a movie about it. You know, what is that exactly? Anger, you know, more often than not, we talk about anger as being more of this secondary emotion. It's, it's not truly what's going on because if you dig a little deeper, oftentimes if you're angry, there's a more primary emotion behind that. Okay, and if you ever take the time to kind of think that through, you'll, you'll see that. I, you know, I'm scared, I'm nervous, I'm embarrassed, whatever it might be. Now, more often than not, at least from my experience, what's behind anger is some degree of frustration. And that might sound like the same thing, but it's a little bit more specific. And what we're frustrated about has to do with unrealistic expectations. Now, what does that mean? How often do we carry with us certain expectations, either about ourselves or about others, that may or may not be realistic? We think they are. And then when those expectations are not met, how do we feel? Typically, we feel pretty stressed, right? Road rage. This is road rage. Does anyone drive angry? 
The unrealistic expectation that I have, and I know some of you have, is that when I'm late, everybody should get out of my way and all the lights should turn green. How rational is that? And yet, how many of us have felt exactly that? Why won't these stupid drivers get out of my way? Because what is road rage, right? It's because nobody knows how to drive. And I'm sure nobody's ever thought about that of you. It's the dumb drivers who don't know what they're doing and they won't get out of my way. I get it. I felt the same way. Now, that's a more extreme example. But where else in your life do you carry expectations with you that may or may not be realistic? This is a common thing. The best way to stay frustrated at all times is to continue to hold on to expectations either for yourself or for others that are very likely not to be met. But you're still holding on to that. I wish my dad would tell me that he was proud of me. Is he ever going to say that? No, but I still wish for that. I wish my kids wouldn't be so loud out in public because it's embarrassing. Well, they're always loud out in public because that's what kids do. But I expect them to be quiet, and then when they're loud, how am I going to feel? I'm angry, I'm frustrated, because I have this expectation that isn't being met. So this can apply to so many areas of your life. Now, part of the challenge is, what's a realistic expectation? And that's the hard part, right? Perfectionism is one that comes up a lot, and, you know, we can sometimes admit to this. Not to stereotype too much, but a lot of times we'll see this with many of the students here at DMU, and this is a a very stressful environment, but we tend to see a lot of perfectionistic tendencies. Now, what's the problem with perfectionism? Well, it's that... It doesn't exist, obviously, but if that's the goal, if that's the expectation, then anything shy of that is going to feel like a failure. And so trying to be perfect in however you define that pretty much guarantees that all day, every day, you are constantly going to feel like that no matter what you do, it's not good enough. That's the consequence of that. Nothing I do is ever good enough. So is it perfectionistic? Is it reasonable? Is it rational? And how can you figure that out? How can you determine that? And that's work for you to do. What are some expectations that I carry with me each and every day? Mostly for myself. I mean, other people, we have, we have that. But a lot of times, it's the expectations that I have might be the same thing that I'm expecting for others. But how do those expectations contribute to this thing that I call stress? I'm really stressed. Why? With a few more minutes here, and again, there's just so much information here that we could go into, but it's trying to make sense of how we're impacted by this stuff. What does it do to us individually? You know, how do we feel? You've all probably heard of deep breathing. Now, there is a science behind that. Um, And again, without going into too much detail, we recognize that, you know, learning how to deep breathe. And this is that part where it's like, okay, this is more of that, kind of amygdala-based, you know, stress. I'm, I'm having this physical reaction in a situation, whether it's because I have um, certain expectations that are unreasonable, um, I'm being triggered by past trauma in some way, um, I, I'm just feeling stressed. Now, if we recognize that, okay, I don't think, maybe this is a thinking error that's happening and, and I need to look at that. But if it's just this pure physiological reaction that continues to happen for me in various situations, then that's what I need to start managing. And it's not taking it out on other people. It's recognizing that, okay, I'm worked up, and it's my responsibility to learn how to manage this better. A lot of times what people will say is, I tried that breathing thing, and it doesn't work. (laughs) You know, (laughs) And you've probably maybe done that yourself. Well, you know, without getting too much into the technique, it's called um, belly breathing, stomach breathing, um, diaphragmatic breathing. And so there's there's a muscle in your abdomen that you're trying to engage. And basically, you're trying to bypass the chest and push your stomach out. And there's all kinds of videos that you can look up and learn how to do this more effectively. But the idea is that if I can learn to breathe properly, and you have to practice it, okay? And that's all it is. It can be, I mean, it's, it's not, I'm going to sit for half an hour and learn how to breathe. It's this. 
If you do it properly, actually, you might actually feel a little bit lightheaded. Why is that? I mean, it's, it's a more effective way to oxygenate the blood. There's some real things going on. Look up the vagus nerve. That's another term if you're interested in learning more about some of this stuff and learning how to stimulate the vagus nerve. There's a whole lot out there in terms of, I want to manage stress better. What are some techniques to engage this thing called the vagus nerve? And it's, it's part of this connection between what's happening with you know, your brain, your heart, your digestive system. There's a lot that goes on. You know, IBS, if anyone struggled with irritable bowel syndrome and you go to the doctor, what's the first thing they're likely to ask you? They're going to say, how stressed are you? There's a reason for that. There might be something else going on, but chances are it's stress. Deep breathing can engage that other part. Remember the other part of the nervous system to balance it out? You have the sympathetic, and you're trying to engage the parasympathetic nervous system, and that brings balance back. So breathing helps. Meditation and mindfulness, this is, you've probably heard this a thousand times, but it's not about sitting for an hour and meditating. I think sometimes meditation can be very intimidating for some people, and it doesn't have to look any particular way. It can be saying a prayer. It can be taking a few deep breaths. It can be some grounding techniques. It can take five seconds. If you want to do it for an hour, you can. I've, I can't. But if that works for you. They say that um, anxiety is the opposite of being present, right? Anxiety is the opposite of being present. It's very difficult to be completely present in the moment, focused on the here and now, while obsessively thinking about something that's happening tomorrow. So with any sort of mindfulness, it's learning how to be present. It's using grounding techniques to just be here in the present moment. Recognizing that thoughts are just thoughts, feelings are just feelings, and this is something that you've maybe heard before as well. This idea that you know feelings are not facts. I don't know if you've heard that before, but you know just because I'm having a particular thought doesn't necessarily mean that that thought is is mine. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily true. I think so and so is mad at me. Okay, there's no evidence to support that. That thought just showed up. That doesn't mean that that's my reality that I need to figure out. Right? That's what a threat is. A thought shows up. It threatens me. I got to find a solution now. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's the truth. So we learn to challenge some of that. Your feelings are valid, absolutely. But we also know that feelings aren't the most reliable thing. And sometimes feelings just show up and they tell us things that may not be true or factual. They're just kind of feelings. So this sort of this final note here is self-care and the importance of that. Probably one of the most common things we hear about, I, I know I hear about it a lot, is any form of self-care. And at the end of the day, when it comes to stress, when it comes to burnout, when it comes to, you know, how do I manage all the demands that are placed on me? The, the, the ultimate solution is figuring out what self-care looks like for you. Now, what's the problem with that? The number one thing that I'll hear from people is, well, I, you know, I, I want to do that, but, it, but I feel selfish. I don't want to be selfish. And so we need to challenge that and, and think about it. And I, I imagine most of you are not this way. But, you know, by definition, selfishness is to completely disregard the needs of anyone else's but your own. It's basically saying that, you know, I'm the only one that matters. <laughs> no one else matters. You know, selfishness is just, it's just that. I'm more important than anyone else, and I truly believe that, and that it almost has like this narcissistic feel to it. I, I'm guessing that most of you are not that way, okay? So we really have to challenge that. Anytime you want to do something for you, and the first thought that comes up is, don't do that, that might be selfish. That's not selfish, that's self-care, and you have to allow that to happen, okay? And it takes practice to do that, to challenge some of these things, to learn more about yourself. There's a ton of resources out there, either it's going to therapy for yourself or going online, like I said, there's all kinds of information, and I could discuss this topic for a whole semester in a class, and we still wouldn't probably cover everything. So my hope is to present it some information that might be helpful to all of you. Um, hopefully, there's some things that you can take away from this. And uh, that's all I have for tonight, okay? 
appreciate all of you coming tonight. Is there anything else you, know, you want to share with? Okay. So um, thanks again for coming. I'll be here for a little bit if anyone wants to talk or has any other questions or comments. Have a great night. Thank you.